Last week, I, uh, I explored the idea of, of how important it is in our Christian walk to pursue knowing God. That, that really is what the Christian message is about. There's a lot of details in Christianity. There are doctrines and teachings that help us understand God. But they should always be in the context of understanding His character. And I look specifically at the very profound uh, passage in Isaiah where the angels... Uh, Isaiah has a vision of the Lord in, in, on his throne, and the angels are crying out, holy, holy, holy. I'm going to kind of dovetail in with that today and talk about what happens when that holy God seated on the throne came down to this earth. How did God manifest that? Where is that similar uh, connection between the holiness of God as he was seen in heaven in that vision in other places in the Old Testament? And how did that translate in the life of Jesus? Um, and so I'm going to use some illustrations and examples along the way. In the vision of Isaiah, the role of the angels is really more, almost more prominent in what Isaiah sees. He, uh, he never describes what he sees. He says, I saw the Lord, but he never describes the Lord. He says he saw that his his train or his robe was so bountiful that it filled the temple. And then he, just, he spends more time describing the seraphim, those burning ones, and how they were uh, covering their faces, covering their feet, and how they were crying out, holy, 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 and the, and the whole uh, temple trembled and began filled with smoke. And so um, the, it's interesting to see the relationship between the angels in that experience and with... Um, and with the presence of God. And so for my kids' quiz today, I want to just ask the question, and I'm, I'm uh, wondering if, Toby, would you help me out again? And um, so we'll have the blue mic. Thank you. And then could I get one more helper here? Mark? Go ahead, and, and kids, some of you have gotten used to this now. I like to have a, a moment of interaction with young people uh, before the service. And the question is just simply this. Think about when angels were part of Jesus' story in the New Testament. Not just him referencing angels, but actual angels coming in any part of the story of Jesus. I'll give you a few hints, but um, if none of them come to you right now, um, share with us any time you can remember angels with the story of Jesus. Is that Lindell? Lindell? In the Garden of Gethsemane. That is wonderful. We often forget about that. I think only one place in the Bible does it say that, and so it's, it's not prominent, but that's excellent that you remember that. Is that Eric back there? Go ahead, Eric. When he was born? At the time of his birth. That's right. Ketsia. When he was born after Sam tried to tempt Jesus. At the time of his temptations. You guys are doing great. There's only five that I found, and you've already found... The middle three. <laughs> so even before Jesus was born, angels were coming to talk about him. That's a reminder. And then after Jesus died, there were angels involved in the story of Jesus. Does that help? Any of our young people? All right, Abby. Back there, Abby. So who did the ink? Well, I'll let her if she remembers the story. When an angel came down to Mary to tell her she was going to be pregnant. That's right. Actually, both Mary and Joseph were visited by an angel. In Matthew, uh, it says that Joseph uh, had an angel come to him. And then we're very familiar with Gabriel coming to Mary in the Gospel of Luke. So there's one more story of, of, of angels with Jesus or around the story of Jesus after his death. Paul was in jail. Okay, yeah, yeah that's, that's in, in the, the book, book of Acts. Acts. That's right. We, we want to also think about when, um, uh, with, with Jesus, Jesus, though. I see Ryden's hand in the back. When the angel rolled away the stone in his grave. That's, that's the one I was thinking of. Thank you so much, Ryden. Thank you, young people. Thank you, Mark and Toby, for helping out. You can just set the mics on the front pew and and, and that, that would be great. great. So, so, yeah, we may think of other times, uh, the angels, but it's interesting. There's not a lot of times 
that we are specifically told that angels were interacting with Christ. Now, the, the scriptures don't always tell us everything. John says at the end of his gospel, if, if we were to hear everything that happened in the life of Jesus, the world wouldn't have room for all the books that were written. So we know that angels were very interested in the ministry of Christ. But as the New Testament is revealed and written, there's only a few times Mary and Joseph was mentioned uh, when, when they, they are told, told and, and they explained about the coming of Christ, then angels come to shepherds. Very interesting. And you've heard many Christmas sermons and, and about that. It's just interesting that angels didn't go to the palace. Angels didn't go to the temple. Angels didn't go to the synagogues or the Sanhedrin or the nobility. It was simple, humble shepherds that were uh, able to have that special revelation and uh, opportunity to hear about the birth of Christ. In the wilderness temptations, interestingly, Satan tried to tempt Jesus by saying, if you do what I say, angels will come to your aid. But Jesus, knowing the scriptures, said, that's not how it works. I'm going to follow what the Lord says. And when he followed what the Lord said, angels did come to his aid, right? So uh, he knew that the devil is a liar and didn't fall into that trap. And so Matthew says that an angel came to minister to Jesus after his temptations. And then in the Garden of Gethsemane, uh, at one of that very critical uh, uh, moments in Jesus' life as he's preparing for the crucifixion, the Bible says that an angel came and ministered to him. And then, of course, we remember uh, the empty tomb. But really, when you think about it, when you think about how the angels interact with God in heaven and how it's revealed in the Old Testament, you see that there is a, there is a change in how they would relate with Jesus Christ on the earth during his ministry. And there are reasons for that. Um, and I'll talk about that in just a little bit. Just to, uh, and to remind ourselves, there are other passages in the New Testament, obviously, that reference angels. And Jesus says this in Matthew 25, when the Son of Man comes in his glory and all the angels with him, does that include the angels that flank his throne and cover their faces and cry out, holy, holy, holy? If it says all of them, then it would include them as well, right? Then he will sit on his glorious throne. Now, if you were a uh, New Testament Jew, if you were a first century Jew, and you were thinking about Christ, or you're thinking about God on his throne, and the angels being with him, and if you were a, a student at all of the Old Testament, you would think about the passage we looked at last week. Okay? And I'm just going to refresh one more time this, uh, this passage uh, speaking about the Lord on his throne and the angels crying out, holy, holy, holy. In the year of King Uzziah's death, I saw the Lord sitting on a throne, lofty, exalted, the train of his robe, filling the temple. Seraphim, again, it just means burning ones, shining ones, brilliant uh, angels stood above him, each having six wings, with two he covered his face, two he covered his feet, and with two he flew. And they cried, <coughs> excuse me, one to another, and said, Holy, holy, holy is the Lord of hosts. The whole earth is full of his glory. The foundations of the thresholds trembled as the voice of him who called out while the temple was filling with smoke. Now, again, to, to get into the mindset just a little bit of first century Jews, when they wanted to think about what God looked like, there were three primary old passages that would likely influence them to a large degree. Okay, and, and this would be one of them. Again, God takes the prerogative throughout the Bible of being mostly invisible. As a matter of fact, he forbids us from making images that we would worship those images in place of him as the invisible God, right? That's the second commandment. God instructs his followers to not be obsessed with what he looks like. Okay? We are to trust his word more than we are to trust our emotions, our feelings, our perceptions, right? We are to trust his word. So throughout most of the Bible, God keeps a distance to some degree when it comes to revealing himself to mankind. Most of the revelations in the Old Testament of God are somewhat uh, foggy. They're come somewhat dreamy, like when um, Jacob wrestles with the man. Right? We know that that man was God, but it's this dreamy kind of uh, experience where he doesn't even realize it to the end. Or when the father of Samson is, is met by an angel of the Lord, it says, in the book of Judges. He doesn't even know that it's God. It's not until the very end of that experience when this angel of the Lord ascends in the sacrificial offering that they realize, oh, we've just been in the presence of God. Okay? 
But, but there, there are a few places in the Old Testament where God is portrayed with certain specificity and definition. And, and Isaiah 6 is one of them. Again, he doesn't go into great detail of seeing what God looks like, but the, the ambiance of that experience. I saw the Lord, and the experience was so overpowering. The vision was so amazing. His train filled the temple, and, and the angels were crying out, and the thresholds were shaking. Although we don't know what God looks like, just the experience of the power of God would have been a very influential image for any Jew who's trying to think about what God would look like. Whatever he looks like, it must be pretty powerful if even the angels shield their faces from him. Um, the second story in the Bible would be from the book of Daniel. In Daniel chapter 7, the Ancient of Days is described with a certain amount of detail. And here, this very important prophetic book that talks about the coming of the Messiah, right in the middle, you have this interesting portrayal of this being called the Ancient of Days. And he, it said that he's dressed all in white, and his throne is flaming, and his face is shining, and he's dressed all in white, and all the, the myriads of angels are there. A very powerful, again, image of what God looks like in heaven. And the last one would be Sinai. Okay? And not just the mountain itself, but that where there was lightning and thunder and smoke, and the voice of God was so powerful that the children of Israel had to say, Moses, you talk to God. We can't handle this. And even the experience of Moses who would talk with God, just the reflection of God's glory coming off of Moses, the children of Israel would have to say, Moses, put a veil over your face. We can't even see God's suntan on you. It's so bright. Or you have the pillar of fire that led them by day. Or the pillar of cloud, like a tornado. God said, my presence will lead you. God said, that's me when you see that fire. When you see that tornado, that's me. Or when the Shekinah glory came into the temple, it was so potent. The glory of God was so powerful that Moses himself and Aaron and the priests had to flee the, the, the tabernacle in the wilderness because God was there. These three stories would dominate the Jewish mind of what to expect when they come into the presence of God. Now, that doesn't mean to say that the Old Testament doesn't have some of the more humble, gentler images of God. I mean, um, the Lord walked in the cool of the day with Adam and Eve, right? Um, Elijah heard the, the still small voice of the Lord, right? The, the gentle blowing breeze, it says in, in, uh, in First Kings, when he heard the voice of God. And you remember what Elijah did when he knew that it was God's voice? He wrapped his face with his mantle, and he went out to the cave. He does the same thing that the angels in heaven did. He covered his face. He realized, I, even though it's a gentle, still small voice, I am now in the presence of God, and I am going to shield myself, just as Moses had to shield himself, or God had to shield Moses. Elijah realizes that. You have the suffering servant, the broken branch, the lamb that was slain. It's not that the Old Testament doesn't have the humbler ideas of God, but for the most part, Jews would expect God to look like one of these things. So is it any surprise that they were a little confused when a 30-year-old peasant walked into the synagogue, the little boy that they had grown up with, and said, give me the Isaiah scroll, the Spirit of the Lord is on me to set, cap to set free those who are captive, to set the, uh, the opening of the eyes of the blind and setting free the captives. And today this passage is fulfilled in your ears. Is it any surprise that the Jews would be kind of like, wait, wait a minute, you don't look like what we thought God looks like. You know what I mean? I'm just trying to be, uh, you know, honest here. It is not shocking. It is not um, um, a, a a scandal that when the Jews came into contact with the holy of holies of the presence of God, veiled as it was in human flesh, that they were more influenced by the dramatic images of God, and they weren't prepared for the humble Jesus when He came. It's just understandable, is all I'm saying. They were expecting this. Now that's God. That's what led the children of Israel. They were expecting this. That's the Ancient of Days. He's the one that's going to come and overcome the Romans. <coughs> they, they were expecting something much more dramatic. The Messiah would come in flaming power and 
and majesty, and they just weren't quite expecting. They hadn't really looked at the breadth of the plan of God in the Old Testament, and they were, uh, they were uh, unable to be prepared for the humility of Jesus. But let's try to look at it now from our perspective and see what we can learn from this experience of what happened and how God, who is holy, 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 was seen by the angels and the experiences that reflected his holiness. And I'm just going to use three examples from the Gospel of Luke. And I just invite you to consider this with me. You can uh, follow the passages in your Bibles if you have them. Um, I put most of the passages on the screen, so it's convenient that way. But I just want to, again, just from, from a de- kind of a devotional standpoint, I want to look at how we can understand that there's no contradiction between these powerful ideas of the holiness of God and also the humble story of Jesus. The first one does come to us in that angelic moment with the shepherds when Jesus is born. So let's just remind ourselves, there appeared with the angel a multitude of the heavenly hosts praising God and saying. Now we know that among the angels, God is a God of order, and we know that there are divisions of angels and ranks of angels and orders of angels that have different functions within God's plan of salvation and within his situation. But it's very interesting what angels were probably involved in this. And again, there's a bit of, of just interpretation and, and, and uh, you know, uh, estimation when it comes to this. But when it says a multitude of the heavenly hosts praising God and speaking on behalf of the glory of God, I'd like to suggest that these were not just simply uh, uh, low-ranking angels. I think these were, if not the very seraphim that, that Isaiah talked about, at least they were extremely honored and necessary angels in God's plan. Right? And, and notice, notice what they, they say, say, glory to God in the highest, on earth, peace among men, uh, with, with whom he is well pleased. We sing that in our Christmas carols. We're very familiar with that. But I want you just to compare that with what the angels said in Isaiah 6. Okay? It's different. It's not the same. But they're very similar. They're very similar. In Isaiah 6, the angels call out, probably some of them the same angels. Both proclaiming the character of God. Okay? So it makes sense, although circumstances have somewhat changed, the God who was on the throne is now the God who's in the manger. Okay? The God who Isaiah saw, that his train filled the temple, and the foundations were shaking, and the angels were covering their face, that same God is now a little baby in a manger. And I know we could have lots of, I'm doing some Bible studies with young people. We just talked about the Trinity. I, we could have that discussion about well, which God was it. Was it the Father? Was it the Son? We are counseled that we should not divide the members of the Godhead in that way and try to determine at different points of time. We are to understand that Jesus in his unity is the God who was on that throne and he is still the God who was in that manger. Is that okay? You're not mad at me. We can live with that. Okay. That same God is in the major. Now, notice what they say and how they're similar. First of all, both of them give this accolade of highest order. Holy, holy, holy in Isaiah. And in Luke, they say, glory to God in the highest. They are offering the highest praise or the, the highest accolade that you can offer. Not the same. They're a little bit different, but they're of the same kind of idea. Holy, holy, holy. You can't get much higher than that. I talked about that last week. It would have been okay. Holy, holy was all, you know, that was pushing it. But to say holy, 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 that is to describe God in the highest. Okay? Next, you have both of them referring to God's glory. Then you have them both referring to the earth. And lastly, you have both of them identifying the host or the people or the context in which God's holiness is being manifested. Holy, holy, holy is the Lord of hosts. That's the Lord of angels, right? And on, uh, in, in Luke, it's peace among men with whom he's well pleased. Not the same, but similar. From the perspective of angels, when Jesus came to this earth, his holiness was not shielded. His holiness was magnified in the humility of Jesus Christ. It did not lessen his holiness that he would come. It magnified his holiness. Notice um, 
what, what it says here, Desire of Ages. Then the joy and glory could no longer be hidden. The whole plain was lighted up with the bright shining of the hosts of God. The bright shining of the hosts of God. What does the seraphim mean? Shining ones. Burning ones. Uh, you think the seraphim were just simply sitting up in heaven? Uh, the ones that Isaiah saw and said, yeah, you guys go talk about the, uh, the infant Christ. Uh, we'll let someone else handle that. Or do you think these were the same glorified burning beings that also were involved in proclaiming the character of God at his birth? Again, I don't force it upon you. You can look at it different if you want. I think it was them. I think they were certainly part of it. Earth was hushed and heaven stooped to listen to the song, Glory to God in the highest on earth, peace, goodwill toward men. The glory of God was not limited by his incarnation. It was magnified in the same way. Secondly, I find this very interesting. The second story where I see the holiness of God manifested in the life of Christ. It's interesting that Luke, unlike the other gospel writers, only talks about Jesus going into the temple one time, except from the time when he was 12. Now, we know he went into the temple multiple times. Uh, John chapter 8 and John chapter 2 and other places talk about Jesus teaching and ministering in the temple. But from Luke's perspective, from the time he was 12, until Luke 19, this is the first time Jesus would go into the temple. Not, he's not saying it's the first time. It's the only time he would talk about it. And I just want you to consider something for a moment. Just this verse, or this part of a verse, just this phrase. Jesus entered the temple. Jesus entered the temple. What was the experience of God when he was on his throne in the heavenly temple. Pretty, pretty dramatic, wouldn't you say? I mean, that's what we've been talking about from Isaiah. When God was in his heavenly temple, when he was seated on his throne, it was a place of such power, a place of such reverence, a place of such potency that angels shielded their face and, and all of these things are happening. But what happened when Jesus entered the temple on earth, that was supposed to be a representation of what goes on in heaven. Did he find reverence? Did he see that people were receiving mercy? Was it a place of prayer and reconciliation? Was it a place where the Jewish nation was understanding the blessings of God and hearing the lessons of Scripture? Is that what he found? This is a unique time in the life of Christ. He is so offended by what he sees in the temple. Now, we know that this would be the second time that he uh, does this in his ministry, but from Luke's perspective, this, uh, this is how he shares it. He began to drive out those who were selling. He sees extortion. He sees abuse. He sees the weak being taken advantage of. That very place on earth that was supposed to be holy and sacred and filled with his glory and filled with, with people reverencing the plan of God and the opportunity for people to be reconciled and become one with him. They had turned it into an abusive institution. And Jesus, who did not do this often, did something very unique. He drives out those who are selling. He says, it is written, my house shall be called a house of prayer, but you have made it a robber's den. Again, I like to just hear how Mrs. White puts it. She says, divinity flashed through humanity. Now, Jesus was perfectly human, and he was perfectly divine. He was not, you know, 60, 40, or, or 90, 10, or anything like that. He was perfectly both. But for most of his ministry, he always let the human side take priority. He fell asleep in a boat. Right? He, he got hungry. hungry. He, he got thirsty. thirsty. He, he got exasperated inside. For most, I'm, 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 I'm talking about innocent of infirmities here. I'm not saying sin. Okay? Innocent infirmities like that. For most of his life, Jesus allowed the human side of him, of his experience, to dictate and define his life. But not in this moment. In this moment, the human side, the innocent infirmities, would not take over. For, for once, in this one time, that holiness, that divinity would flash for him, investing Christ with dignity and glory he had never manifested before. He had never manifested such divinity 
as he allowed to happen in this experience. He says his voice sounded like a trumpet through the temple. The displeasure of his countenance seemed like consuming fire. Remember what Isaiah said when he saw and had the vision in Isaiah 6? He says, woe is me, I am undone, for I am an unclean man. I live among, I have unclean lips and I live among those who have unclean lips. He experienced that same terror of God as a consuming fire and wondered about his own ability to survive. And the same thing happened here with Jesus when he cleansed the temple on this experience in Luke 19. The holiness of God was revealed in a more dramatic and divine way at this time. And it was not just for the purpose of some arbitrary thing that God should be treated a certain way and we should just have have a, a certain opinion of, uh, of God. You have to remember that the purpose of the temple, the purpose of the holiness of God and everything that is revealed is for redemptive purposes. By them turning the temple into this place of extortion and abuse, people were missing out on the mercy of God. It wasn't just that his name was being disgraced and his honor was not being upheld and his holiness was being perverted. It was that people were now being barred from experiencing salvation grace, God's salvation and grace. Does that make sense? It's getting late and you're hot and you're just going to nod to whatever I say, huh? Yes, Pastor, I agree. Can we go home now? No. Almost done. Divinity flashed through humanity. And the holiness of God was experienced in a way that had never been felt before. The last one, and this is my favorite. Obviously, the supreme act of holiness that Jesus accomplished for us was his sacrifice on Calvary. And you can look at each of the stages of the cross. You can go from Gethsemane all the way to the resurrection. And you can highlight different elements that, that reveal how God's holiness was manifested. But this one, this one might, might just be my favorite. And it's only recorded in Luke. It's only recorded in Luke. And it says he was saying, Jesus, remember me when you come into your kingdom. And Jesus said to him, Truly, I say to you today, you shall be with me in paradise. The Son of God literally stopped dying long enough to extend grace and mercy and forgiveness to a humble sinner with knowledge. Did we lose it? Oh. Where were the angels when Jesus was on the cross? We can assume. Now, we know that, you know, people were crying out for his crucifixion. Some of his followers and the women, they were weeping. We know that the devils and demons were cheering. We know that the Father, because Jesus had to become sin on the cross. Even the Father had to shield himself from the perception of Jesus. But I think when the angels saw that at his lowest moment, Jesus still put the salvation of that lowly soul in such a position, I think they couldn't help but say to themselves, now that's holy. Holy, holy, that Jesus would go to that length to make salvation available to even the least. And the holiness of God is seen in all these elements of the cross, but in that moment especially, I think the holiness of God rang throughout the universe. Last week I talked about this. He is holy, holy, holy. He is holy with us. When Jesus came as a baby, he was Emmanuel. God with us. The very presence is, is altered and shielded through the incarnation experience and being veiled in flesh, but it did not diminish his holiness. He was still holy. He is holy above us. When divinity flashed through humanity there in the temple, we needed a God 
who could perceive of the abuses and take the initiative and authority to reverse those and make once more the temple a place of mercy and holiness. And he is holy for us. He would even stop dying if at that moment you were to reach out to him. And he would go and he would reach out to you. The God we serve is worthy of our devotion. Amen? The God we serve is worthy of our attention and our pursuit of knowing no other God no other God has done for us. No other influence. No one else has done for us what God has done. And he shows us that he is holy, holy, holy throughout his life in these few examples. As we close today, uh, we have a closing song. So I'm going to go ahead and invite our team forward. And this will be the closing song. So go ahead and stand and sing with us. And then I'll have a prayer afterwards. Uh, for a benediction. benediction.